All right, I'll, I'll go ahead and start. This is Robert Feeney, and I'm going to give you a little context here of what, what we want to take as the third presentation here, advancing the conversation into a very specific context. This is the context of a large-scale organization, namely IBM. Like how you take this micro-learning as a format, and we've been talking about a number of ways that micro-learning can be executed. So we're going to be uh, describing a particular way that it gets executed that we call performance first. And it's it's going to help contextualize it. It'll be familiar to some of you and totally foreign to others, but it'll be how do you contextualize micro learning so that it is effectively driving performance inside of an organization, especially a large scale organization. Now you're seeing the term ring -orang at the top of the screen there. ring -orang is the name of the software solution. I'm uh, the... Uh, I am one of the founders of this organization that we call Knowledge as a Service that, and one of the creators of ring a -Rang. And I've worked with Ken Stockman, who's with me here. He's a lead learning strategist at IBM. And we together have been working on this performance first paradigm. Uh, and Guy, in fact, has as well uh, for a few years now. And if, what we're going to do here is show you the, the, the case study of how it operates inside a large organization, and then even give you some senses of how it works even beyond just, let's say the one, we're gonna go into like case study on how it's done with leadership, how, how micro learning is used to drive performance in sales, compliances, technical trainings, et cetera. So to, to start out, we'll introduce to you what is performance first as a framework? How does micro learning drive performance measurably? And then the learning organization response uh, how we take it from learning as we currently know it as a paradigm into knowledge as a service using familiar patterns of engagement and design. Why that's why that matters is because you can't just ask people to take on a whole new format unless it somehow ties to what we already know or else we're going to get really confused and resistant. Strategic micro learning at scale, like how scale is going to be a big part of the context of what we talk about here. Engaging people one-on-one -on -one is one thing, and it's kind of the, the preferred way of really driving behavior change and performance. Coaching, right? How do you get that out at scale? And then making performance first work, we'll go into those scenarios, those examples. So to start, I'm, I'm going to introduce what it is as a framework, and then I'm going to ask Ken to, to start describing how does this work inside of a large-scale organization? And what is the response that the learning organization inside a, an enterprise needs to take on to make it work? So the framework. First, to, to be able to help you understand what we mean by performance first, we got to show what the current uh, paradigm is, which we would call learning first. Learning first is the notion that you're, you're really trying to drive as much learning into people's minds as possible. And so what happens in an organization is out here in the performance world, let's say business leadership is asking for a training. And it'll ask the learning organization, can you please get me a training? Training organization says, hey, can you get me some subject matter expertise? Well, we don't really have time. So you got to use source material. You build a course. You run people through it. And then you send people back to the front lines, back into doing what they're supposed to do in the business. The problem is what happens in that gap between those two organizations is very much is what's been described by Renee and Maria Elena and so young, which is that there's this, there, there's a, a big thrust of learning that happens and then it falls right out of your head per the Ebbinghaus forgiving curve that's been cited here. And you're going to retain something to the tune of 20% of that. That's what happens in the gap between the end of a learning course and what you're expected to do on the front lines of your life and your work. And what's worse is that because these are such different organizations, there's no return on learning that's expected and or measured at all. So you have no idea if that spike in learning that you got actually made a difference. Well, when you're using the performance first paradigm, you can keep people coming back. And it is the micro learning format that allows you to do that. You get people to come back to it over and over and over again so that you can have learning retention at 90% or even better. Now that's not performance but it's a massive first step towards performance. And with enough repetition, you can build a bridge between training and performance. And what I'll show you is that it's not only the bridge, but it's, it's actual measurable return on learning that can be measured. Like we're showing that performance is done. 
Now to do that at scale, you got to automate this. You have, and to, to be able to automate it and capture data on it, you have to draw a map so that you can kind of set it and forget it. To be able to do that, you got to have both the performance organization and the training organization working together. And that doesn't always happen very well or often. So what we brought it to bear is what we call a goal design. It's a map effectively that uses a methodology that we, we proved out through clinical trials called AST. And it stands for Attitudes, Skills, and Knowledge, A-S-K. By focusing on the attitudes especially, you're able to make a gateway for skills and knowledge to be ad ad adopted in the flow of work. But it takes a lot of repetition to do that, and that's the key. How do you get repetition into a busy person's life? And then more importantly, maybe, how do you keep the leaders in the performance organization and the training organization actually working together over time in real time, like over weeks and months. Usually they just throw over a, a course request and training throws back the course. The map gives you a chance with very little time taken away from leadership to just come back like a, for a half hour every week or a couple of hours every month to see how the map is being fulfilled. Like our attitudes being shifted, our skill and knowledge habits being formed. Now, again, at scale, the only way to get there is you got to add one more layer to this, and that is governance. To be able to get across multiple geographies and around the world, and you've got to be able to deploy, analyze the data, remediate wherever there are weaknesses. And again, that is a collaborative effort that happens between leaders in the performance side and leaders in the training organization. So you got to have uh, a, an automated system that makes that drag and drop simple to look at the data and take actions on it. So Ringarang, it's the name of the software. The reason that we built it was to, tr to create some automation around this so you could effectively scale what we're calling the performance first paradigm where it's not about learning first, trying to get all this learning into people's lives. It's about reverse engineering. What does performance mean to the organization and making sure that that process is automated. So in summary, what you got here in the learning first organization, unfortunately, is a lot of disempowerment that doesn't get talked about much. It's people trying to learn, wanting to learn coming out of training, organization wanting people to learn, but in fact, their brains won't do it, not in this modality. And if you're not measuring the returns on learning to see if it actually made it into your day-to-day -day life and you're applying it and turning it into behaviors, then there's no actual return on learning and no return on investment. There's a lot of risk of failure there. So taking the mystery out of it, Performance First allows for empowerment where the learning organization and the performance, meaning the business leaders, are working together in real time with the learners, measuring that it actually made a difference in the organization, measuring that there's performance. So Ken, if you'd be so kind so, as to kind of put some yeah. context to this. Great, thanks Robert. And um, just to kind of reiterate what Robert said earlier, so we've been working on this for over a couple of years now, just to kind of even get to the point where we've got this view of performance first. And it started um, much like many um, micro learning type of opportunities where we were just focused on the learning, just focused on reinforcing the learning. Um, over time, <clears throat> as a learning professional in a large corporate organization, um, and understanding that if we're really going to move the dime on um, supporting performance, we need to kind of come up with a different approach to how we engage and leveraging the, the, the ring around tool was a great way to do that. But then more importantly, kind of using the ask methodology um, became a, a core source to that. So it took us, we took a step back and said, okay, what are some of the shortcomings of what we call learning first uh, approach that most organizations kind of adopt. Um, it's very much, uh, you know, misses the mark in lots of ways on supporting uh, operational performance at the end user level. Um, the folks who come into the organization, particularly some of our learning leaders, aren't necessarily taught to think right about the corporate environment. They want, you know, they're more service oriented than strategic. And then finally, the learning orientation, the for learning first orientation gets focused on learning as the primary outcome. If you look at uh, any of the metrics that most of us use today, um, it's focused on things like satisfaction and the learning, uh, satisfaction scores, that, you know, NPS scores, you know, how was the learning, how was the experience? It wasn't about 
what did you take away and what did you get out of it and how are you applying it and what's the performance boost as a result? So shifting the performance to performance first framework kind of reorients the conversation. It changes the mission in our organizations and the learning and L and D side to empower people and deliver that return a higher return on learning. Um, it creates more technology, um, um, provides them with technology that's new and unique, but is very familiar, as Robert's going to go through and has already been highlighted before. And it shifts from this kind of learning design orientation to a performance design. How do we how do we make people perform um, along the lines of the business? side of the organizations who pay the bills uh, and earn the money want the uh, performance uh, to, to go. And maybe integrating that to what, uh, or, or rather pulling forward what So Young, uh, so Young was putting uh, out there as the notion of humanizing technology. Uh, right. The reason it's empowering is because as Ken says, you, you, the organization needs performance and it has to look a certain way. But you can't even get there if you don't have an empowered workforce that feels they really got to feel it, that the organization's gotten up underneath them, supported them with just-in-time learning and tools. Here, this is what you need in the flow of work in order to be effective. So to kind of give you a, a picture of how the learning organization response that Ken and I have been working on for a while, how that needs to work in a performance-first paradigm as a support mechanism to change where you're seeing more and more technological impact, you're seeing more scale, you're seeing more rapidity. How uh, does the learning organization adapt? Well, first, there's, there's a demand here. The relationship with business here, there's a demand that the learning organization like, and subject matter experts on the business side, the performance side, like subject matter experts, stakeholders, have to identify the KPIs in the beginning. And what I don't mean is learning objectives. Now, there's nothing wrong with a learning objective, but as most of you will know, anyone who's been involved in learning design will know, oftentimes they're styled as understandings. Like people will understand this. Problem is, is understanding things doesn't necessarily get performance done. It's habits. It's people doing things over and over again that gets it done. So how do you, how do you get those stakeholders and SMEs to actually identify from the very beginning what the real map uh, is that matters to the organization, you got to create something that we call performance design. Rather than learning design, we're talking about performance design. You uni unify or collaborate here among learning designers, subject matter experts, and stakeholders to map out the KPIs and directly map those to human habits. Like what do people have to take on in order for the business to get its results? Then you develop content and we've been talking about content creation now as part of the, the micro learning format. You develop the content to be delivered as performance support and extend it through the flow of work. So like in the flow of one's day, and that's a rigor unto itself. So what we've refined as a process and embedded in our software is engagement management. And that brings together your learning designers, but also with some governance, with deployment experts and people who are instructors so that they can enroll your learners in the first place and then engage them ongoingly in a way that's effective. Then you got to measure that it's actually working. I think it was so young that said, uh, uh, you know, you, what you measure. measure, treasure. measure. <laughs> yeah, I like that. I like that. So you, you got to measure that the habits are actually being formed, that people are doing what they're out to do and you measure that it's happening. Then you have a return on learning. And then where it's failing or falling short, repeat it, remediate, Make sure those KPIs are actually met and then attribute. This is really important. You got to attribute the successes to the learning, to the intervention. And that's what we call performance support. Again, uniting learning designers, what we call engagement managers, and then the business stakeholders to monitor what's going on without taking a bunch of their time. So the bottom line you'll see there is that it changes the whole mission orientation to empowering people in a way that also empowers the organization because you're delivering a return on learning. That $380 billion that's been spent globally that was cited earlier, oh my goodness, actually making it that that has an ROI to it and then being able to do that in real time. And this is something that if you've been in the learning profession for a while, 
it, it is your core mission, right? You always want to increase the value of the learning organization to the business. Just like marketing struggled with this message for years, how do we produce, you know, return on return on marketing dollars? You know, the learning organizations of the world need to kind of continually justify their existence, and and I think that through this gives a bit better opportunity to start chipping away at that need in the face of um, you know profitability pressures and things like that 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 many of you who are dealing with this have you know organized. So Robert went through this kind of not this conversation before and you know the key message from this from this point is we want the the shift from kind of learning to do um, to knowledge as a service which I borrowed from their you know their name as a company makes sense right everything is as a service these days so knowledge as a service this kind of repetitive constant exposure continuous learning um, over kind of the one and done type learning events or prescribed curriculum or even mandated learning that many organizations do um, to kind of get beyond that, right? <clears throat> so the shift really is away from this, this prolonged conversation to getting to a point where you are engaging with the business stakeholders and subject matter experts around the goals of anything that they think that they want to do from a performance perspective. Why are why are we doing this? Um, it's is, is it to boost profitability? Is it to, to de decrease costs? Is it to improve compliance rates? Is it to avoid fines? You know, there are there are business goals at the end of every stream here in the learning space, and the more we can get to that, and the more we can target that and measure it, right? Figure out ways of measuring it, the more we can kind of boost that return on learning. So. You know, these are these are the conversations that many of you have. You know, I've we, I've been privy to a lot of these. It's it really is about kind of, you know, getting engaged with subject matter experts over time and 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 try to minimize even that connection where you get hung up because your your subject matter experts who are helping you design some of the learning suddenly vanish because of business needs. Um, right. The key is to minimize that interaction, right? Because we think we can take it from there if we can really focus on kind of the next, the kind of evolved version of this conversation, which is, do we have 90 minutes to do a goal design um, where we get to the business goals of the organization um, so that we can create a learning intervention that really targets those KPIs, right? And that is the essence of what Performance First is all about. And, and so what it does for the learner yeah. itself and do you want to take this or do you want? No, go ahead. You can take it. Okay. So this is this is shifting now from the organization side to the, the learner side. Like what is what is the learner feel? How are they experiencing this? And the first thing it's pointed out on the left of the screen here is it's a reminder of what I need to do today. So that's kind of simplistic, but it's important. Like what's important for my day right now? And that's the and just then, in time. That was the just in time component of what, um, yeah. what we heard from Renee um, earlier and Mariana is what is that key component of micro learning. And then making sure that it's aligned with the business goals. So your business leaders actually have to have a stake in what you're doing day to day, right? So you're not just off on your own fork path here. You're doing something that aligns with performance goals that are stated from the beginning. And then here's where the empowerment comes in. You're being handed the tools that you need and the know-how on how to use the tools most effectively as you go through your day. That's the, I think it was, uh, it was Renee or Maria or Elena was mentioning nano, uh, nano learning as one of the formats. That is really what Ringerang does about one minute at a time at random times through the day. It's, it's just to say here, here's how to use some of your most effective tools but then we put it into a format that I'm going to show you. I'm going to do a demonstration of the software so you can see how this works, where there's a social experience, there's some competition in it, light competition, and it's it, we call it the game that plays you because it comes and nudges you at, at seemingly random times of the day and says, hey, try this. And depending on how you react, you get to move along on a leaderboard, and it makes it very compelling. Uh, so here's what we're leveraging to make this work. It's patterns of engagement that we already have. So just a little bit on the underpinnings, you know how we all have this, uh, we, we know how Facebook and LinkedIn works. Well, there's a, a, something in our technology we call a learn more item. And it's effectively what the, the micro learning is. It's something viewable or readable within 60 seconds. Viewable or readable within 60 seconds, not a long form training video. In our case, not even a five minute training video, but more like an excerpt of 30 to 40 seconds about one thing you 
you'd want people to think about or do. So that that does kind of harken back to what we see when we're thumbing, you know, we're scrolling through our Facebook or our LinkedIn. And also like Twitter or SMS, we have what we call flash messages. So it's like just a pop-up that flashes, gives you a message on what to do next or what you ought to know next, keep you moving along in the flow of information. But then unlike the busy social feeds where it can get a little overwhelming, this is done in an app, either on your browser and a PC or on your iOS or Android device. And it's got its own real estate and it'll pop up. And this, in, in this case, it's a little bit more like an advertisement, kind of a billboard that comes by, but it's interactive and it's entertaining, got a call to action, and then it's gone. You don't sit there and study an advertisement. It's just gone, right? Mm -hmm. And then you can come back to it or it's going to come back to you later on, rinse and repeat. You hum those lyrics later in the day. What's that? You hum those lyrics later in the day. Exactly <laughs> right. You know, I have, uh, one of our, the chairman of our board sometimes does conference talks and he says, he'll actually ask the room. He says, you know, who remember, who's old enough to remember my baloney has a first name? It's... <laughs> And then people will answer OSCAR. And it's like, if you have been around 40 years ago, you'd remember that commercial. And it's astonishing <laughs> that the brain will remember it. But it's with enough repetition and interest and entertainment, it, it stays in your brain. So another thing that helps it stay is motivation. And the, your motivators that are extrinsic can matter almost as much as the ones that are intrinsic. What you're looking at here in your screen is an example of how people uh, for this particular IBM challenge. It's called the IX Design Challenge. It has to do with designers in a, in a, a robust organization they have within IBM that uh, uh, actually can design out content and learning and uh, other types of communications uh, for customers. And it's astonishingly robust. I think you've rolled up something like 60 design organizations into IBM to make it all work. But in any case, this challenge was asking them to join sweepstakes. And sweepstakes in, in our um, vernacular is something that you can earn just by responding. So every time you respond to a request to answer a question, you could get blue points, which is a branded rewards points inside of IBM, and you can redeem those for merchandise. And, uh, and this is an example like of the flash message I told you about, where you just have a pop-up and it tells you what you need to do next. But these are all just 30 to 60 second experiences that are nestled within your day and don't ask you to invest time, what they ask you to do is respond. And there's a lot of science around those responses and the cued recall that can be developed by doing this in a way that's effective. We actually took it through clinical trials for a number of years to show that we can shift human behavior by empowering people to do what they're up to. And there's a fairly simple formula for doing it. Whatever people are up to, if you can get them to come back to it just for a moment at a time, gamify it a bit, just give a notification when it's useful. Make it really easy to respond to where you don't have to be a gamer. You don't have to have any particular skill. You just respond. That micro learning format where you're not taking time away from people's day. So you're adding a bit of respect to it, right? Respecting that you have to take your day in, in, in the way you planned it and not you know, steal away time. Less than five minutes a day in total. Making it social, making it fun and relevant, and then developing actual habits that turn into sustained behaviors that you wish you could form, but a lot of times you don't. Why? Because most of the time we don't think we have the time or resources to do it. Again, this format respects that, but it focuses, it does so by focusing on what does it take to form a habit? And the habits got to measurably show that you're developing talent and you're actually doing it to KPIs for the organization. So first you got to identify What's the habit that needs to be formed in order to drive performance? And then what are the actual business practices that have to be done over and over again, repeated actions? That's a really big key here is the actions. And I'd like to show you in the software briefly how we do that so you can get a picture in your mind of it and then take you back to some conclusions that we've drawn in our case studies here at IBM. So let me start what by- I, what, I, what I really like about this from, a, from an application perspective and from a learning the knowledge organization perspective is the the short amount of time. So we talked about duration earlier, about three to five minutes. Right. You know, so let you know slight you know low levels of of demand, um, spaced over time, right? So that spaced repetition concept also comes into feature here, which is you know uh, one of the things that we don't get with our learning most of our learning first design. Right. So let me show you that that 
spaced repetition at work here. What you're looking at on your screen now is a simulator that's inside of the Ringarang software. So when a designer is creating content, they're using this simulator to, uh, to create what is a question sequence actually. And this question sequence lasts for about 40 minutes, sorry, 40 seconds on a ticking clock. And you can see the ticking clock here is a green fuse that burns down. I'm gonna see, actually, I might be able to pull this up here. Yes, I have, wonderful. Okay, so this is my, my phone screen and I'm gonna go in and show you one at work, okay? Cause it's kind of jazzy to show it this way. Um, <laughs> this is my iOS screen. This is a timeline you're looking at for a cybersecurity awareness program. It's one that I've run at my organization here recently because we got hacked in fourth quarter and I needed to develop some new behaviors in myself and other employees. What you're looking at in the timeline on the cybersecurity awareness program is a couple of these flash messages. Like if I click on this one, it says, get a leg up on the competition. It says how you can go to the learn more library and review some of these micro learnings in advance. And then when the question comes, you're gonna ace them. Now here's the actual question. I'm going to open this one up and we're going to play it live. So you see that green fuse burning down. It starts with a clue. It says, this attack can be done on site by a delivery person, a customer, or even a coworker. And what's happening is I'm playing this in solo mode. It could be done live. That's when it first nudges you. But if you don't have time, you can come back to it in the solo mode and even advance it manually here if you want, which I'll do now. I'm going to advance into the question. It says, an unlocked computer considers an inserted rubber duck USB safe because it reads it as what? A keyboard, a printer, a modem, or a lava lamp. So I'm going to go ahead and choose, let's say, it reads it as a printer. Lock your computer is the insight. You may think that you're safe at the workplace, but a delivery person or even a coworker can insert this rubber duck USB device and you're screwed. <laughs> <laughs> and so here, I got that wrong. It actually reads it as a keyboard, you can see now. And the insight really is trying to get me just to lock the computer by clicking Windows L. And, and then it'll show me how to do this. So you've gotten a quick request to play a question in a socially competitive environment, and then you get your micro learning. And this micro learning should be in our format is readable within 30 to 60 seconds. And then again, remember I mentioned the video, you don't go to a five minute, 10 minute, 20 minute video, not in our format. In our format, it's a 30 to 60, I'm sorry, a 30 to 40 second usually excerpt clip from a training video that's just about this one thing, which is lock your computer when you go away from it. All right, so moving back to the sim, that was the simulator of my actual phone. Now this is the back end of our system. What has this question, which again is the clue, then there's a quick, question, then an insight, and then the learn more item here. What has this built this way is the ask methodology that Ken and I have both been mentioning. When I click on goal drivers here, you're going to see an interesting little map that really makes the difference. We have the designer pick a topic from a drop-down menu. There are two topics chosen here. I'm the first line of defense, and antivirus doesn't work. And those are mapped to human habits that have to be formed because subject matter experts and stakeholders said, if these habits aren't formed, we won't get these business results, which are reducing the incident rate of successful phishing scams and reducing the incident rate of leaving devices unprotected. Like these were mapped out in 90 minutes at the beginning of the format. Now, if any of you have built a competency model before, usually there's a six week process at least that goes of passing a spreadsheet back and forth and getting decisions made, we have found in 90 minutes in a facilitated session, you can build your whole map of KPIs and human habits that are gonna get you there. Then just for this question, the designer identifies what's the action you want them to take? What action do you want them to do or not do in their daily routine to shift their behaviors, most of the times to shift their attitudes? And then lastly, get this, what's the obstacle? Like what's in the way of them taking that action. Why won't, why, why are people gonna just keep relying on antivirus and thinking it has nothing to do with me? Well, it's because they think, well, I, I can rely on it. I've been told experts have said so, I'm, I'm not an expert. Okay, so that's a, something that needs to get shifted. And the way that works is this map, I won't go too far into it, but just to show you the interface, there are only five business results being requested here. 
in this goal design. And those five were figured out in the first 10 minutes of working with the stakeholders and the learning leaders to get this one measurable goal about making people the first line of defense against cyber attacks. That means the person who's at the front desk or the CEO. And then you map those to the human habits. Here are those five results again. And if I expand one, you're going to see there's a handful of business, I'm sorry, of a human habits, either as attitude, you see that A, skill habit, or a knowledge habit. That's the ask methodology. And we found that the balance among those three is what really makes the difference in driving behavior change. Then you identify all the topics that have to get covered in order to perform that habit, which will deliver this result. And that's how you write the questions. So in, in our vernacular, we call them challenges that run for a week in length. This series of challenges called Cyber Gold has four week-long challenges in it. When I expand one of them, you'll see somewhere usually between five to 10 question sequences that get delivered during the week. And each one of those is mapped to a specific topic, which is mapped to a habit or one or more, which is mapped to the result and the goal. So you can kind of see how it all hangs together. And that's really critical because you're going to monitor all of this in real time. This is one of the two reports that make the difference. As learning leaders and as business leaders, you watch this and you get to see in real time your goal design laid out as a report. Here's your goal. Here's your handful of ha a results that you got after your business. And here are the habits that are mapped to it. And you look for the weak spots. So here's a weak spot right here. 64% is the performance on all the content related to this result that they're targeting. So I'm going to click show related and it resorts my list. Uh, I'm seeing another weak spot here. So I'm going to resort again. See, now we're right down to here's the habit we want to drive. Here's the topic where it's gotten really weak. And here are the questions delivered related to that topic. And now you're looking at the culprit. This question was delivered. Yes. 0% percentage of performance, including myself in this organization. And here's the action that we're trying to take, but we can't even get there because people just, are, their takeaways aren't strong enough. So what we can do as a learning designer or as a business leader is prescribe something to do with that question. First, you can QA the question and see what was wrong with it. Second, you can replay the question and see if it makes a difference. Third, you can write more topics on this particular habit, or you can write other habits you need to add in to get to this result. It makes it actionable in real time. And so now I wanna come back into um, the slides so that I can show you what we're doing from kind of zooming out. At a high level, what we've done is we've retrofitted using what we call this ASK methodology, a competency model that's different than uh, identifying learning objectives. It's the business goal, the business result, and the attitude, skill, and knowledge habits that have to be fulfilled. They have to be formed. In, then you go into topics, what you want to teach. That's performance first versus the learning first. And actions is really the key. Like if you don't identify the actions and worse, this is what we found in the clinical trials with the U.S. Department of Energy is if you don't identify the obstacles, like what's in the way of someone taking the action and you don't address that, it's the hidden enemy to all learning. People are just gonna in, quietly in their minds go, yeah, 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 they want me to do it that way, but I already know another way of doing it. I'm, they, they'll never know, I'm gonna do it my way. And this is the only way you can get at driving performance and getting the business as well as the individual to collaborate. And as I mentioned in the in the in the chat, you know, it, once your learning designers get used to the flow, um, it becomes a lot easier every single other time they start to develop programs. So the learning curve may be um, a bit steep at the beginning, but what we found when we did this with our two programs and IBM um, was that the more we repeated the process, of going through and designing the the questions, um, and building the topics and the habits and all that kind of stuff, that became uh, easier to our learning designers, especially those who were um, kind of the go-to people that we used for uh, most of these programs. So we did test this in, in multiple different ways. I'm going to go through just the global new hire program example up front. We did include the core skills program test in the appendix of these slides that you'll get. Um, so we had a um, particular program, a part of our new hire program, 
and this was a couple of years ago now where we, we trialed this uh, for a leadership component. Um, and we did this in four different geographies um, just to, to get a sense of how well it resonated in different, in different environments. Um, we had uh, four week programs and uh, the target for us was to create kind of these levels of success, right? So over 60%, 7% of engagement by the participants, 70% um, higher score for the um, questions delivered to them. 90% um, participation, um, not only in the questions, but then also in the learn more components, and that it had to be very usable, right? So from the standpoint of our, of our metrics, um, when we started out, we began to kind of see, okay, here's, here's some challenges we had, right? We had some challenges of the very first implementations of these, um, but what we realized very, short, very soon thereafter from an organizational perspective goes back to something Robert said earlier around engagement management, which was an, an essential part of making this work in a, at scale. Um, by the time we got to our fourth geography in India in doing this, you can see kind of the effect of kind of improved engagement through the, our instructors, uh, reinforcing the knowledge and reinforcing the process, as well as some of our geography teams um, supporting that with, with the learners. So when it came to then looking at, okay, so results aside from the standpoint of performance, how usable and how easy was this from a learning perspective, from a learner perspective, given all the demands on their time? So we had a series of a couple of different questions, very basic. Um, did answering the training questions on your phone take up a lot of time? Obviously, most people said not much, which is great. Um, going through the next question, did you find that the, the uh, micro learner of the application challenging and a fun way to engage with learning? And as a learning professional, engagement is my is my mecca. Um, and so definitely, certainly, um, yes, was the big answer there. Um, in terms of the timing, right? So we talked about duration, just right, just amount of right of of time. Eighty eight percent said yes just the amount of right uh, uh, time. And then finally, was it helpful, right? To share what and reinforce your experience in the Lead with Impact class, 100% said yes. So really great usability feedback. And this was something that as, a, as, a, as an organization, this plus the, the, some of the feedback we got from our core skills program and other programs where we've tested this, um, really started to um, help us adapt this performance first message. So now that all of our global learning strategists are starting to talk in these terms and begin to look for opportunities to roll this, this, this concept out. When we, we talk about, we're, we're coming down to the end of our time here, and we, I wanted to share with you maybe a little more specifics about what we mean when we say habits. So when you're get, getting into the workplace, what, is, what do you mean by habits? Well, Ken was just illustrating a leadership behavior. So a lot of times an attitude habit around that was that I believe there's always something I can do to bring leadership into a conversation, for example. And if you think about real life, we don't always think that way. A lot of times we're just going through conversations reactionally and we're just trying to get stuff done. And we don't know that maybe it's up to me to bring in some leadership. So that's an example of an attitude habit, reacting to a life situation in a way that you can lean back on your habit of I'm going to bring leadership into this conversation, right? Other types, just so I can give you this, what I asked of So Young earlier is like, give me a few scenarios. And she gave me some scenarios for everyone to understand of how this can be applied. So here's an example of habits that can be applied in sales. Um, so for instance, with an, uh, here's a case study where there is a requirement to increase the unit sales for a national lighting company. And we need, they wanted to up-level their lowest performers into being higher performers. And using Ringarang, they were able to increase by 84% the total sales from the bottom 50% of the performers. It's helping to get those bottom performers to get past some of their attitude resistances, some of the self-talk that gets in the way. And just by handing them the tools in the flow of work, they become measurably effective in performance. How about change? Change is a big one, right? Where you've got these massive change programs. This one was where the target was to implement an Oracle system and it affected more than a million customers. They were worried every time they do this kind of thing, they always get a tanking NPS score. So this one had a seamless go live when they used Ringarang and it delivered a 15% increase, I'm sorry, a 15 point increase in the NPS score. Now, why that happened was because you were able to, in micro learning fashion, get people ready for the new system 
in the flow of their day for just a few minutes a day while they're using the old system. So you're graduating them into the point of go live. That's the beauty of micro learning. It gets into the middle of your day. Also in compliances, the CIO of this large scale IT organization needed to stop getting non-compliance fines. They got them every time they had a six month audit. So we were able to help them pass their audit for the very first time with no fines, just because we kept getting the material up in front of their people over and over and over again. Employee engagement, as Ken was mentioning, it's the Mecca. It's so important for every organization. Here's an example at a major telecom. They had a certification program on 5G. They wanted people to join. They wanted them to opt in. So after they did a full webinar and a lot of yay, yay, rah, ha, you know, uh, rah, rah, let's get them in, only 1% of them signed up. So they used Ringarang with enough repetition and familiarity. Within two weeks, they were able to get 30x improvement on that. So they were up to 31% after two weeks, I remember. So this is, this is what's possible with micro learning when it's applied in a way that it empowers people. And so we're hoping that as you go through this and listen to the session that you're taking away a couple of key things. Number one, mm -hmm. that the sense of performance first really does create uh, and, and, and deliver on the full promise of what learning organizations should be doing. But it creates this, does this through a common vocabulary uh, on performance and employee need, right? It, instead of learning outcomes. Um, with performance right. first, um, our organizations in the learning space um, become much more a strategic partner, which is something we've always stri strived for. Um, increase this concept of return on learning to enable the organizations to transform, uh, the learning organizations to transform more to growth drivers than cost centers. Um, it focuses on recall and reference, right? So the, the mechanics of, of what we've gone through definitely supports the, re the recall operation that we, that we talked so much about during the session and during these, this whole conference. But it operationalizes knowledge, right? Which is a key essence of the performance first component and an action at the point of need versus a point in time. And then finally, habit formation, super critical to a lot of organizations. IBM is, is definitely, in fact, our entire new leadership framework is built around habit formation um, as a process to the fast changing dynamic business uh, environments of today, which we all are very familiar with, they become key enablers of achieving and learning read to business goals, right? Which is this, the essence of what the organization wants habits to do. You can actually check this out yourself if you'd like. There's a couple of ways you could do it. Uh, if you want to just try to take a photo uh, of your screen here on that QR code on the right, then uh, there's a form you can fill out and request a demo. Just put in your name and your, and your email address. Or, um, you know, if you can, you can also probably communicate with Guy afterwards or, uh, or just write down our email addresses here and we'll, we'll get you set up so that you can see how this works um, for yourself and in the context in which it's of interest to you. Mm -hmm. And uh, Guy, I want to make sure that we, uh, we uh, open up the opportunity for any questions, but so I'm going to hand it back to you for that. Um, thank you so much. Um, that was yeah. enlightening. And as somebody who works in IBM, it was even more enlightening as well. <laughs> so, right. so that was great. So thank you. Um, yes, um, I'm going to open it up to the floor. I, I know there's some questions that have come in through the chat, um, which Nitty, thank you very much, um, has answered. Um, but if you want to sort of go into a bit more detail on those questions, or if anybody's got any other questions, um, this is your moment, please. Um, if you've got questions for Robert, and or Ken, please. Thank you, Needy, for the uh, answer. Needy is part of my organization, so she was good enough to get in here right. and, and field some questions in real time. This is very personal. I'm happy to do that. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, no, I think it's fantastic, Robert uh, and Ken. Thanks for sharing. Uh, a question I have is, you know, um, and I'm all about performance-based learning, you know, but the mindset mm -hmm. shift required to first get people to think about that as well as then to change their habits and their behaviors to do that is um, it's a pretty monumental task. So I'm curious on any thoughts on how you've been able to do that. Well, as you, you might have noticed that there's a, there's a fairly robust methodology that, that kind of gets, goes through a declension process from map all the way down to like, what's the individual action you want them to take or, or that a person wants to be able to take in the flow of their day. 
probably the best way to describe it without going into a bunch of wonky detail, which I'm happy to do on demos, by the way, but, but maybe for the purpose of answering your question, is like think about courses as a grocery store. Like you, you, put, you create a course, right? You go into this grocery store and the way, how do we go into grocery stores? We go zip through a few aisles, we grab our food, we go to the checkout and we've come out with some very small subset of what was in that grocery store, right? And even if you're one of those people that goes through every single aisle meticulously, you still come out with a small subset. You can compare that to like, what do you actually learn out of a course? And then, but then go through these declensions per your questions, so young, uh, so young is that you, <laughs> how much of that food you know, have, are you able to prepare? Buying the food has nothing to do with the skill of preparing it. So then there's a whole other world of how do you build that skill? Well, maybe I'll follow the recipes. So some of your food has recipes on the boxes. Well, how many of those do you follow? Maybe one out of 10, one out of 20. And then if you are following that recipe and making the food, how do you know that it actually worked? Like people enjoyed it. There's got to be some way of measuring that. And are you able to do it often enough with repetition so that it's a habit and you don't need the recipe anymore? Then if you are measuring that people liked it and you do have a habit of making it, what good does that do for an organization? Maybe if you work for a restaurant, they could say, well, some people seem to order this more often than others, but are you measuring if people get turned off by it? Do you go to Yelp and you look at the comments? How do you measure the whole thing? So that, that what I just walked through was a pretty big declension from a grocery store, which is like a course, all the way down to the extremely thin slice of what actually gets done over and over again and gets measured. So what we've done is created the map to how to go through that process. And when I showed you the reports, it's a engagement management process that we had to develop and refine. And a lot of that work was done with Ken and his crew at IBM on how do you come back to the data every day or every week to see what's working and not working and take actions around re-engaging people that fall out, making it more relevant for this group versus this group. That's a rigor unto itself that often that isn't really in the current paradigm. And really from our perspective, the biggest mindset shift that has to happen is in the learning organization. Um, we find that the learners themselves, they they, because of the repeatable and the very familiar um, way of engagement, they're used to this kind of, of activity already, right? So it's not really taking a lot of effort to kind of convince them to do it and to adapt mm -hmm. to it, right? They, they get the benefit of it, but they don't understand necessarily the theory and everything they don't need to. Um, but our learning organization is, and our, and our business stakeholders are the ones that kind of need to get used to it more. There was a, you know, there's, so I put this in the comments uh, during uh, Renee and Maria Elena's uh, presentation earlier. There, there's B.F. Skinner was a somewhat controversial figure in research, right? And his, the Skinnerian research, uh, they would sometimes call it rat psychology, right? And so it got a bad name for a while, but now it's been kind of coming back. People are realizing they want to throw the baby out with the bathwater on this really good research, which was one of the many things he discovered is You'd have a rat go through a maze and you'd, you'd have it, it, could, it would tap a, a, a you know, like a, a little lever and out would come some food, right? And then it tapped the lever and it gets some food again. Pretty soon the rat gets what it has to do, right? And the, you know, the, the negative connotation here is, well, wait a second, humans aren't rats. But just look at the research for one second and see what we can get out of it. What he found is the most effective way of having the rat continually come back to the lever was that it didn't always work the same way every time. What actually shifted the rat's behavior was that there was a certain randomness that sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. And I'm and, and forgive me, I'm mixing a couple of these research, but it was, it was the same general outcome, which is there's a certain randomization where it shows up at different times. And then sometimes you get the outcome you want, sometimes you don't. Why would that work better? Because it drives a sense of hope and anticipation that this is going to be something I want and is useful to me. Guess how we go through our normal daily life? We go through unpredictable, unscripted situations, people to people. We come up with insights and conversations we didn't plan for. We have to deal with those situations in real time. And it's sometimes great and sometimes not. Sometimes it's useful, sometimes it's not. And that's how the brain's wired to respond. So we created a technology and an approach that kind of mirrors that. 
in the course of people's day. That eventually helps you drive behavior change. So I've, I've got a question, if I may, um, from mm -hmm. Robert N. In, in the shift towards sort of performance first, what was, in your experience, has that been an easy transition for learning departments to get used to, or has that, you know, has that taken sort of a bit of handholding through that process? From my perspective, definitely handholding. Um, yeah. You know, because and guy, you're very familiar with this. I'm not going to tell you anything you don't know. You know, our our organization is large, diverse, varied, and geograph ge both a has a global and geographic component. So, kind of getting people aligned behind the concept is taking a little bit more time. Um, and yet, when we talk to our business stakeholders, they get it. They say, "Yeah, bring this on." Uh, a good example was when we did our uh, seller support for our with our Adobe partnership, um, having that having the the global lead for our Adobe uh, business um, basically buy into this from the from the get go. So yes, I want I want to leverage micro learning to improve performance of my practitioners so that we can achieve our our our, our results. Right. So it, it really does line up well with them. Um, and, but from the or learning organization, it's it, it's taking a bit more time from from my perspective and just kind of making the case, demonstrating um, the value, which is is key, um, and overcoming some of the, the the perceptions that this takes more time than kind of other type other forms of learning engagement. Um, but as I said, learning yeah. curve is is short. Um, it's steep but short. So Young had mentioned that about, it was like, if you do PowerPoints, you know, you're, you're basically a content creator. So yep. what we do in creating courses normally really isn't different. It's just, there's a, there's a, it's a shift in modality. And anytime you're asking anyone to shift to a different modality, you're, you're, you're it's like, have you ever tried to change your diet? You know, you, it's hard for everybody. It's never easy to change your habit. But that's the point of building a habit because what makes it hard to change is because habits, when they're entrenched, are reliable. So that's why you got to get to them. And yeah, it's it's not just a habit that you're trying to drive in the learner. In the case of what we're doing at IBM, for example, and our other customers, it's also with the designers, the organization, as you put it. And learning as an organization has been, I would say, unintentionally disconnected from the business in a lot of cases. It's not really an, a it's not the fault of the organization. It's more like the conditioning over the last hundred years when we yeah. have taken small companies where you work at the general store and your dad was your manager and he was showing you how to stack hands on the shelf. He could work with you in real time and your micro learnings were what your dad told you to do, you know, <laughs> when you were stacking them wrong. Good to scale. How do you deal with that? Well, you got to create a technology and approach that kind of replicates that idea in just in time, in the flow of your day nudges that give you a wrench when you need a wrench and that's that's a paradigm shift for the learning organization too because you got to stay engaged over time with the business that's new and i think also the the, the hr perspective of this as well is that learning many learning organizations are part of h of hr in many organizations and so the the concept of performance first guy from from what i'm seeing is you've got you've got a little bit of ambiguity. Okay, who's, who owns the performance ball, right? Um, as you know, in our organization, HR owns performance from the perspective of me as a professional growing up in the organization, my career development, my feedback from my managers, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and that's one side of performance. The, the performance that we're talking about, the operational performance is something that we need to really focus on. Yeah. 